We will go ahead and get started. I think others will be coming in as they finish their coffee break. But the last session was very interesting, and uh, even I think it was worthwhile that it, it, it took the time that it took. Uh, this session is entitled uh, Impacts on Road Investments. And the purpose of this session is to discuss the major issues that affect the organization, management, and funding of programs, and also the role of technology exchange in that. Uh, my name is Michael Avery. I work for the Office of International Programs in the Federal Highway Administration, and I'm honored to be here. Um, I'd like to give you two numbers to think about. On the panel, the distinguished speakers we have represent over 65 years of combined experience. They have lived and worked in many countries around the world. And I think we're going to hear some very interesting things from their points of view. The other number that I think is very significant is that these representatives, these gentlemen represent populations that total approximately 1.8 billion people. Okay, 1.8 billion people in these three countries uh, and the impact on transportation is going to be a very interesting topic. The agenda for the session is that I will introduce the three speakers in the same way that Joe Tu will introduce them. The speakers will then have uh, their opportunity to speak, beginning with the United States, then India, and then Brazil. We will have time for questions and answers, and then I'll make a few points in summary. So to begin, uh, our first speaker will be Mr. Tony Kane. Joe, I think, in the last session did a very good job of introducing Tony. I'll just hit some highlights. He, Dr. Anthony Kane, joined the uh, AASHTO, joined AASHTO in 2001 as the Director of Engineering and Technical Services. In his current role, he oversees the development of transportation policy and legislative proposals, the development of hundreds of technical publications and standards, including those for safety, quality, bridges, geometric design materials, and ITS, development and licensing of AASHTO software, uh, review and accreditation of laboratories, evaluation of transportation projects, radio frequency filings with the FCC, and support to numerous AASHTO committees. And as Joe also said, Tony previously served as the US DOT's executive director from 94 to 2000. And uh, he had a 30-year career with Federal Highway involved in many different aspects. Dr. Kane has won numerous awards, including the AASHTO President's Special Award of Merit in 2001 and the U.S. Presidential Rank Award for Distinguished Service in 1996. And Dr. Kane holds a B.S. in Civil Engineering, an M.S. in Civil Engineering, and a Doctorate of Business Administration. Our second speaker is from India. And I'm going to pronounce his name one time, and then he gave us permission to call him Bala. And you'll see why in a moment. <laughs> uh, Shri Chandrasekhar Bala Krishnan is the additional secretary and financial advisor in the government of India. He works in the Ministry of Shipping, Road Transport, and Highways and he joined the Indian Federal Service in 1974. He has worked in a wide variety of areas, uh, very impressive. He worked in the agricultural industry as a district magistrate, worked in the food and civil supplies, horticulture, animal husbandry, fish, uh, fisheries, education, and training ministries. And he has held a variety of positions and as I said, he currently serves as the additional secretary and financial advisor in the Ministry of Shipping, Road Transportation, and Highways. He has a, an MS in Physics, an MBA in Finance, and he is a Gator, University of Florida, and uh, a Master's in Public Administration from the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, and a, uh, M a degree in Philosophy from the Indian Institute of Public Administration. I would like to note that uh, Bala traveled 24 hours to be here with us, and I, we thank him for that. Our third speaker is Mr. Checker, Jabor Checker. He represents the Brazilian federal government. He is a civil engineer with a master in science degree in transportation from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. 
and he works for the National Infrastructure Department of Brazil. And basically what that means is the Brazilian government has created an entity, an organization, that deals with transportation infrastructure. And Mr. Checker works within that in, uh, infrastructure agency. He, uh, he has served in that capacity since the 1970s, and he is currently the coordinator of the Road Research Institute in Brazil. When we invited a representative from the Brazilian federal government, Mr. Checker was uh, asked to participate in this. He is also a representative of Brazil in PIARC, the World Road Association, and he is president of ITS Brazil. Um, Mr. Checker traveled about 14 hours to be with us from, from Rio, and we thank him for that also. Tony only traveled a couple hours, so we don't have to thank him quite as much. <laughs> Uh, what is very interesting about Mr. Checker is that he offered to us already the first example of international technology exchange. We've only been here for a few hours and he's already offered the first example of that. And what it is, is transfer of technology from the Turner Fairbanks uh, Research Center, Highway Research Center, on accelerated pavement testing. And Mr. Checker is going to be involved in setting up similar testing facilities in, in Brazil. This is a very distinguished panel, a lot of experience. I really look forward to their presentations. Tony will talk about the United States focusing on safety loo, and then when we will hear from Bala and Mr. Checker about the situation in India and Brazil. And uh, first, I'll pass it to Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, Bala and I would like to thank you for making us younger because we, we collectively added up our years and we, th we, think, we think we're much more than 65 years of professional service, but you made us younger, so we'll take that. That's great. And it's a real pleasure to be here with this nice, intimate group. Last group was a little too large, right? So we didn't tell them where the room was and, and we just mysteriously appeared here and we'll do real work here. As, as Margaret Mead once said, a, a, Great things can happen with small groups, and in fact, only great things in this world have ever happened with small groups working together. So we're the small group, we're gonna do some great things. What happened to my presentation, speaking of great? All right, let me bring it up. What I'm going to do today is, is very quickly run through four broad areas. Uh, I was asked to give a description of what AASHTO is and what state DOTs are, particularly for the, for the non-state DOT oriented audience, for some of the, uh, those from, from abroad, and then to give some secret information on this word safety loo. Now, for our visitors from India and Brazil, this is a test. You know what safety loo is? It's, it's our multi-year highway and transit legislation that the president signed in August of last year, and it funds tremendous amount of funding at the national level to state and local governments for transit and highways through fiscal year 2009. And I'm asked to give just some broad highlights so that you get an appreciation of the program structure in the U.S. And then I'll mention some of the key concerns that state DOTs currently have, and I'm drawing from lists of surveys that we've done of our state DOT secretaries and, and some issue areas that we're going to have in a CEO forum in September where we'll have a one and a half day session with CEOs just talking about their current issues. And then take a look at some future issues for funding in transportation in the U.S. because I think they have relevancy around the world as well. AASHTO is a nonprofit organization founded in 1914 and significant because it works hand in hand with the federal government. And by that I mean AASHTO has a, a three-part mission. One, to develop technical standards and guidelines, and two, to do policy issues, and, and three, to share knowledge. On the technical guidelines and standards, they're voluntary standards. And as I mentioned in the earlier session, in response to a question, they become mandatory when adopted by the federal government regulation. At the federal level in the U.S., the significant federal aid highway program got started in 1916. And so we've been a very close partner. So in 1916, the federal statutes created what was called the Federal Aid Highway Program, which is funding from the federal level to the states in partnership with the states. 
But in this country, our 50 states are very autonomous, very similar to models like you might have seen in Australia, where you have a group called Austroads, who represent the six states in Australia plus New Zealand, very similar to concepts in, in, uh, in TAC in, in Canada, where the provinces are very independent. And so it's a way with ASHA to create voluntary guidelines. Think of it in the early days of having 12-foot lanes that met at the borders. You know, I think the interstate system was the clearest one of, of clear, distinct geometric standards that, that you had technologies meeting and coalescing at the borders. For the future, it's going to be ITS standards and information technology where we can transfer issues. All states are members of it. We have members of foreign nations who are members of, of ASHTO. As a, a foreign member, you can become active in our volunteer committees. You can receive discounts on our publications, etc. Most of the Canadian provinces are members, a few of the, the Mexican states, and a and, uh, number of foreign nations as well from abroad. We cover all transportation modes as well. State departments of transportation are very broad and very diverse. I mentioned earlier today that on average they own 19 percent of the roadways in the United States. That's an average state, but no state is average. Virginia and North Carolina, for example, own more than 90 percent of the roadways, California 9 percent of the roadways. So very unique in terms of what they own. And then in terms of highways, every state department of transportation owns and operates the major highway facilities. So your major freeways and expressways and metropolitan areas and at the national level, the major arterials are going to be owned by the state governments. The federal government tends to, has a small percentage of roadways that they own on state parks and federal lands. But for those from abroad, when you see something like the interstate highway system, the federal government doesn't own it, the states do. And then when you see routes that have U.S. symbols on it, you might think those are federal roads. My parents always did. They used to call me and wanted to fix their road down in Florida because it was a U. But they would they lived on Federal Highway, believe it or not, which is U.S. one. It's got the U.S. symbol on it, not owned by the federal government. I had nothing to do with it, but I did influence getting a traffic signal in front of their house <laughs> because I did have power at that time. Not anymore, but but it, it's very. Uh, you have to really understand the way the systems are owned and operated in order to be effective in in bringing about change and dealing with them. Also, in terms of what they own, virtually every state is involved in short line rails. In the United States in the 1970s, there was tremendous economic regulation of both the rail industry, the trucking industry, the airline industry. You had to get approval to operate and you had to get approval on the rates you charged. That's all out the window now. And what happened was rail consolidation caused rail abandonment, caused greater efficiency in rail service. Lots of the rail lines that were abandoned became short line rails. Niche rail service, state DOTs got involved in ownership and operation of many of these rail lines. State DOTs are involved in what's called general aviation airports, not the commercial airlines. Commercial airports are only operated by four state DOTs. Maryland DOT operates BWI Airport. There's one in Connecticut, one in Alaska, and one in Hawaii. And then many of the state DOTs are involved in owning harbors, like in in Virginia and in Maryland and Louisiana. Many have ferry systems. So it's very diverse in terms of the makeup of my members, the state DOTs. Just in terms of safety, it makes it so difficult. For example, in only 18 states are the motor vehicle agencies. Those who license the drivers and cars are in the state DOTs. They're in public safety agencies in all the other states. Only two states have the state patrol which worries about police enforcement of speeds on the state highways. The others are in other agencies. And, and many of the behavioral programs for safety, which flow through the governor's safety reps, aren't in state DOTs as well. So it makes our mission in solving transportation problems be one of, of having to form partnerships and coalitions to achieve success in the U.S. in safety, in incident management, in a whole host of areas. It's not just the transportation players that matter. To give you a picture of, of, the net, of where the revenue comes from and the magnitude of spending in the U.S., this is a picture in 2004. And these next series of slides I, I, uh, I captured from, from a presentation that was just given two days ago to the commission on, uh, that was formed by legislation that Congressman Oberstar mentioned on, uh, on looking at the future of funding in the United States. The highway program in, in uh, 2004 $130 billion was spent in one year, and that was for capital, for maintenance, for operation of the highway systems. $30 billion of it came from the federal level, $62 from the state level, and $36 from local governments. 
Uh, transit, similarly, $38 billion, $168 billion overall. If I gave you a time series chart of this, what you would see is that the federal program has become a smaller percent, the local program has become a bigger percent. And by local, that's the 3,300 counties and hundreds of thousands of towns, cities, and municipalities that also fund and own roadways. I was asked to give a brief explanation of Safety Lou, which was a multi-year funding level. And what I've chosen to do is just show a couple of the major program areas, the dollar amounts that they're funded at, and how they've changed over the, the years from the previous authorizations. The Interstate 4R program is, 4R means rehabilitation, reconstruction, resurfacing of the interstate. It's really not building new facilities. Funded over the period of this legislation at about $30 billion a year. It's about 13% of the total pot, and it's a 25% increase of where we were uh, in previous six years authorizations. National Highway System Program, you can read the numbers. The two together then, some 28% of the pot are focused on those very high level state road systems. The interstate system, which in the United States is 47,000 miles, it represents 1% of the total miles in the country and carries 24% of the total traffic. So a very efficient system, has half the fatality rate of any other system. So a very efficient system in terms of 1% handling 24% of the traffic and having half the fatality rate. National Highway System includes the interstate. It's about 4% of the total miles in the U.S. and handles 40% of the travel. When that system was authorized by Congress in 1995, I had worked in our planning office at that time and then was executive director, but I had put that concept together and we looked at, across the, the world at other systems. And just coincidentally, in both Germany and France, their national highway systems were 4% of their total roads and 40% of their travel. The exact size and scale of the national highway system in the United States. And then there's a whole host of other programs. The, the last one on the list is something called equity bonus, which just gives back to the states a proportional share of how much they contribute to the Highway Trust Fund. And it was a real political battle this last time around to give more and more on a percentage basis back to those who were called donor states. Those states who tended to have high traffic volumes, generated lots of money for the Highway Trust Fund and didn't get much money back. And they wanted to get more. And so this program gives them the ability to share back into their contribution to the Trust Fund. While it's big, as we look to the future, there's going to be lots of questions because lots of people are wondering what is the purpose of the federal program, what's it geared to, and what do we need to focus on. I believe the interstate and the national highway system is going to get greater focus in the future, both because of the growing economy needs, the growing population needs, need for new corridors, and need to redefine the federal role in highway transportation. And I think a clearer federal role could be those higher level systems. The safety area made tremendous gains in this last legislation, and they need it because in the United States, we've gotten flat in terms of getting success. 43,000 fatalities a year, 3 million injuries a year. The last time a dollar number was put on it was in the year 2000 by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. They, they said a $230 billion a year economic loss from road crashes in this country, which is just huge. The World Health Organization has defined safety as you look out 15 years to be the second leading cause of days lost in everything. It's about 15th now. And the reason is the motorization that's forecast to take place in China and India and elsewhere. And those large growing economies where the number of fatalities is just going to be huge. Three years ago in China, they were killing over 100,000 people a year with 10% of the vehicles that you have in the United States. They, they kill more than twice as many as the United States and motorization is just growing rapidly there without adequate road infrastructure. So the numbers are going to be huge. Millions of people killed per year is the, is the forecast. Just huge. So it's, it's not only technology sharing here, but we need to share the technology abroad in the developing nations in the area of safety. What the Congress did was create a new core program for safety. They get called for a comprehensive safety plan where every state DOT has to have a plan ready by, 2000, by October of, of this year and operational by October next year, or there are some limited sanctions that will take place. But the two biggest things that were deficient in earlier comprehensive safety plans of state DOTs were local roads, 
Remember I told you that 19% of the roads are only owned by the state and it varies all over the place. Most of the earlier plans just focus on state highways. They got to focus on 4 million miles of roads now. And they tended to just focus on highway infrastructure improvements because they were developed by the safety offices of DOTs from the engineering unit. And they failed to focus on the behavioral side, on adequate speed and speed enforcement, on adequate seat belt usage and laws, on adequate driver licensing requirements, and adequate booze enforcement, et cetera. So those, big, those areas, I think, can be the silver bullets. They were the silver bullets in Australia, in England, Netherlands, and France in the last five years, cutting their fatalities in half by having a real high level of automated speed enforcement and having an unbelievable level of booze enforcement. They cut the numbers in half. Is the U.S. ready for it? No. State legislatures are, tend to be libertarian, individual rights kind of organizations who are afraid of and will not pass tough laws, and that's our challenge in the U.S. The research area was another big gainer in, in uh, safety legislation. I just give a couple of examples of things that, that were done in the legislation. Uh, from a state perspective, we were very much interested in continuing the long-term pavement monitoring program. Uh, half of the amount we requested, but at least it was funded. Training and education was a real strong point, I think, in the legislation, including allowing greater use of all the federal aid categories for training. Uh, at the last minute, I worked with the, the Hill to remove a, a limitation on percentage caps so state DOTs can use as much of their money as they want for training and not have to match it as well. So I think that was the, the real boon that you had in this, in this legislative package. The LTAP programs increased to $11 million a year. We had called for a doubling of it. We didn't get that. And the UTC programs increased both in a number of universities as well as the dollar levels tremendously. Significant new programs in ITS congestion, freight, and as Congressman Obastar said, the Future Strategic Higher Research Program, which we called F-Sharp before it was legislated. Now that it's legislated, we're simply going to call it SHARP-2 because it isn't a future program. It's underway right now. So it'll be now known as SHARP-2, Strategic Higher Research Program, Roman numeral 2. Innovative finance is another big area that the six-year legislative package came up with. Uh, TIFIA is, is a loan program, innovative finance loan program and guarantee programs. They lowered the thresholds and expanded project eligibility, so, so more types of projects can compete for that. State infrastructure banks is, is SIBs, expanded to allow creation and, and allow multi-state SIBs. Tolling, uh, tremendous changes in both uh, the statute and, and probably likely practice allowing greater use of tolling in the U.S. Any new lanes on the interstate, however, have to use automated toll technology. Uh, as part of the deal, that we extend the value pricing program. Construction and reconstruction pilots are continued but made a little easier in terms of flexibility. And one thing that's brand new is private activity bonds, where you can have private sector funds be tax deductible with private activity bonds to stimulate more, more public-private partnerships. We in Ashto don't see it as the, the salvation. We see it as a necessary requirement for the future. Uh, we've had innovations in the, in the area of leasing of assets. Uh, Chicago Skyway was leased to McCary and Centra, the Spanish and Australian consortium. In effect, got a 99-year lease to run the Skyway, gave a couple of billion dollars to the city of Chicago. Same crew, $3.5 billion to Indiana. Indiana prop for their toll road. They probably leased it at a little lower than they should have uh, because those investors are subleasing kind of their investment and getting some more money on the deal. Uh, the same groups are going to be building new, new tollways down in, in Texas and elsewhere. So things to be learned. Uh, obviously, the, the public-private partnerships on toll facilities in China, a tremendous number of, of interstate toll facilities being developed there in, in India and elsewhere so that we, we can clearly learn from that. Why I say it's not going to be the total answer, because there are many parts of this country that are going to need new capacity on the interstate, but aren't of the density and traffic volumes that could sustain these public-private partnership deals, where we have to use more general finance to, to fund those in the future. This is just a graphic saying the same thing in terms of what the bill did. It gives you both grant incentives, tax code incentives, regulatory incentives, and credit incentives. As many things as we could think of to work with the Hill on this. Obviously, the Wall Street firms are very much into this and involved in it and work with us in, in helping support these concepts. Now, 
You all heard Congressman Obasar talk about the importance of the Highway Trust Fund. It truly is important. I remember one of my first foreign missions was in 1972, Nihondoro Kadan in Japan, which is their national toll authority, had me over to talk about it and explain the Highway Trust Fund and the way finances worked in the U.S. And, and Obasar is right. People are intrigued by the concept of it. This chart assumes the funding from 2010 on will be flat in the highway program at the level it was ramped up at in, in safety lieu, which is a little over $40 billion a year. Similarly, and, but then let's project what's going to happen. The highway balance in the trust fund is forecast to go bust before safety lieu runs out. It's currently forecast on the latest Treasury Department trust fund estimates, which get updated every six months. These are the latest mid-session estimates that were done for the 2006 budget would forecast the Highway Trust Fund to go bust before reauthorization next time. On the transit side, things were a little better. It doesn't go bust until 2013. Uh, clearly, at the federal level, if we're going to maintain the level of funding that we had in safety lieu of $40 billion a year for highways, we have to have an increase in the gas tax. While there's long-term solutions to all alternative fuels and VMT or kilometer-based charges in the future, probably for the next 30 years, the fuel tax is still a very viable mechanism to, to raise the rates on it. The last time it was raised at the federal level was 1993, 13 years ago. It's ridiculous. Purchasing power has gone to be like nothing uh, of that after 13 years. So the Congress really needs to, to look at that strongly. We'll push hard for it. I think uh, Congressman Oberstar, should the, uh, I should, this won't make this a political talk, but should the Democrats take over in the Congress, he would be heading the committee and he'll lead a charge for increasing the fuel tax and, and increase the program funding to the Highway Trust Fund, which is vitally needed. Key in long-term and short-term challenges that, that we see in the funding area is the national funding gap on transportation. When I, uh, I chatted with uh, the visitors from Russia earlier today, I asked them what their major challenge was, and it was funding. And he asked me what our major challenge was, and I said it was funding. Now, it's a matter of scale and appearance, but, but we have a huge funding gap here as well. National Trust Fund faces a deficit, which would be horrendous. Created in 56, one of the best things Eisenhower ever did in the sick room in Walter Reed on Ju June 26, uh, uh, 1956, was to sign the legislation creating a highway trust fund that really made America great, and it needs to be maintained. So we need to have some short-term fixes. Long term, there are potential solutions. Sure, we're piloting things. Iowa State has a big research project underway. Oregon has pilots on, on mileage-based fees. Kind of makes sense. Really makes sense when you think about how low they can be to get money. Think about it. Today's federal gas tax level at the, at the federal level is 18 cents a gallon, which at 20 miles per gallon is less than one cent per mile. State gas tax average is about 25 cents a gallon, which again is about one cent per mile. Together, two cents per mile is all it takes to run our current program. Yet, the cost of owning and operating an automobile in terms of insurance and depreciation as estimated by federal highways is close to 50 cents a mile. So think about it. We could say, let's just raise your fee one cent a mile. You'd say, not bad. It's the equivalent of a 20 cent gas tax, but not bad. Some of the niche public-private partnerships that are coming in, like for example in Washington, D.C., they're going to have hot-priced new toll lanes on the, the Capitol Beltway. Those niche toll charges are going to be 25 cents a mile. And people are saying, no big deal, we'll pay it. But think about that at a gas tax sense. That would be 25 times 20 cents per gallon. Huge, $5 a gallon. So. In the long run, it's going to be great for us. We can really explain things more easily, potentially get more money, but that's the long run. And, and we can easily think of that in the long run to do it that way. Current issues, uh, safety loop implementation. We're working with the feds on implementing regulations, a future federal, state, local roles. Many people said it took three years to pass the safety loop legislation because no one could agree on what the purpose of it was. I think that's hooey. I think we can really agree, and I think for the future it's going to be more of a, of a national level role, putting greater emphasis on the interstate system. Our initial estimates are that we need to double the system almost in terms of capacity and size and number of miles, 
It was originally legislated in the 50s, dreamed up in the 30s, when we had about 100 million people in this country, and now we're going to have 400 million people. So it was a concept and a view way in the past. International trade wasn't anywhere near where it was today. The corridors weren't anywhere near where they were, and the population wasn't anywhere near where it was, and yet we were fixed in terms of this system. And so that has to change. Uh, net new revenue for transportation is essential. We can't just get by with Band-Aids. And the reauthorization of the federal program would, is, is geared for 2009. If, it, uh, if it's delayed like last time, it could be 2012 by the time it's enacted. <laughs> Additional issues are credibility and accountability of transportation departments. We have worked tirelessly with a number of committees, and, and we're convinced that those state DOTs that have been effective in raising funds in their own state legislatures have been ones that can be transparent in the way they do business, can show they're accountable, can deliver projects on time and on budget, can operate their systems on a 24-7 basis, are into incident management, can respond to incidents, can clear them, can show you're maximizing use of the system and you're delivering new projects cost effectively. When you do that and you tell people what you're going to do the money for, you get, cash, you get tax increases at the state level. Worked in Ohio, worked in Washington, it can work other places. Future transportation workforce skill need sets, absolutely essential. So it boils down to, to three broad areas we're going to have at a, a CEO forum in September where we bring in our state DOT CEOs and we have very uh, informal discussions where everybody talks and participates. As it turns out, the University of Minnesota Transportation Center will be the contractor for that effort. We will have it at, at University of Minnesota. We'll focus on three broad areas, roles and partnerships. How do we deliver projects in the future? How, are we, how do we deliver them on time and on cost? How do we deliver safety numbers that count? It's going to be through partnerships. We're really changing the way we do business in this country and have to continue doing it. Customers, stakeholders, what does it take to make them happy? What's the business community want? I think it was part of what Pete Ron was, was saying. I mean, uh, Pete Ron. Pete Ruain. I get my Pete's mixed up. They're both very vivacious, bombast, you know, excite the crowd. Pete, Pete Ron is the DOT Secretary of Missouri who will be at the conference later this week giving two talks. And uh, see if you don't get, get them confused as well. But, but at any rate, Pete Ruane saying you have to reach out to broader stakeholders. What our state DOTs are finding, those that are effective, are really meeting the needs of the business community, meeting the needs of their state legislatures, broadening their stakeholder base, and saying what is it you want and then deliver it to them. And then finance and funding mechanisms, we're going to share knowledge. This will be at a high level T-square kind of session. Kind of the same thing you're doing, but we're going to have state DOT secretaries, number one person, sit around and talk about innovation and what they're doing in their, in their pilot state, if you will. Because as I mentioned earlier, in, in the U.S. is really 50 states in D.C. and Puerto Rico, all with different models, all with different examples, all with different concepts. And that's an attempt to give a quick overview of the U.S. on, on issues that we have, issues facing the top leaders, issues that the CEOs care about, and hopefully then T-square swinners, LTAP centers, training directors, et cetera, are meeting the needs of the highest level officials in your state. Thank you. Yes. We'll hold the questions till the final speaker finishes. I'll pass it now to uh, Mr. Balakrishnan from India. Yeah, great. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you for this opportunity for giving you a brief presentation on national highways development in India. I took the liberty of changing the topic, which was impact on road investments, considering that for many of you, it might be the equivalent of the LTAP 101. So it's National Highways India 101. I'll start with the road network at a glance in our country with expressways just 200 kilometers and national highways, which are 65,000 kilometers constituting just 2% of the total length. 
State highways, 4%, and major district roads, which are 14%, with the bulk of the roads being the rural roads, which in many cases are not what we call pakka in uh, old British English, which means they're not blacktopped, a lot, large number of it is just dirt tracks, which you would probably not uh, look at for trying to reach from place A to B. The total of 3.13 million, 3.3 million uh, kilometers sounds fairly impressive, but then considering the kind of diversity that we have in our country, we know that we still have many miles to go. The national highways constitute just 2% of the road network, but surprisingly carry 40% of the total traffic, much like the other countries. So you can see the kind of pressure that's on our national highways. 55% of the national highways is two lane, and with 35% being given single lane, and only 10% is four lane. National highways are the responsibility of the federal government, which has initiated just recently what is called the National Highways Development Project. This we have conceived of in seven phases going up to 2012 and 13, and uh, it's expected to attract approximately $45.5 billion of investment. The state highways, major district roads, rural roads are managed by the state governments. And state highways we consider for upgradation to national highways, considering their strategic importance, connectivity to industrial hubs, ports, or other metropolitan cities. The state government funds for road development is supplemented by a dedicated central road fund, which is much like your, the highway trust fund, with the diesel and petrol cess constituting the dedicated central road fund. <clears throat> the key challenges are, the primary one is given the diverse geographic zones, the cost of construction and maintenance varies very significantly across the country. Secondly, we'd like to believe that private and foreign investment will supplement our federal allocations for road construction and maintenance. Tolling has been recently introduced on a selective basis for trying to get increased public acceptance. Acquisition of land, shifting of utilities, and cutting of trees are, have been identified as reasons for delay in completion of the road projects. With the increase in input prices, the cost of construction of roads is rising as elsewhere in the world. And for us, attracting private sector and foreign direct investment is a key challenge. Technology upgradation is proving fairly difficult in some of our non-national highway development project projects. And we are trying to improve the synergy between federal and state governments for develop a more balanced road network. And of course, financing is a major issue given the long payback periods in the road sector. <clears throat> Asset management suffers due to inadequate funds for maintenance. And in many states, contracting capacity for medium or large size projects is just not adequate. And with the growth in the exim trade, we are trying to improve our port connectivity, which is an area which requires priority attention. This is just to give a small snapshot of the National Highways Development Project, which consists of the Golden Quadrilateral, which is to connect our four corners of India, starting with Delhi, Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay. And we have the corridor development in the north-south region and the east-west corridors with port connectivity and other projects of economic importance constituting a smaller percentage with the total length of 14.27, it's 14,279 uh, 14, kilometers. <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, the financing of the NHDP is through the cess on petrol and diesel, securitization of the CES, 
and trying to improve the, the quantum of public-private partnership, long-term loans from multilateral agencies like the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, and tolling of roads, which is being introduced on a slightly, it is at a selective uh, introductory phase at, as of now. The Central Road Fund, as I mentioned, is from the dedicated fund from petrol and diesel cess, and these funds are used for the development of the national highways, state roads, rural roads, and for railway safety measures. For the fiscal 2006-07, the collection of cess constituting the fund is projected at 2.73 billion, which is a fairly sizable amount considering it does finance a lot of our activities. From public-private partnership, which has recently been introduced in our country, we are trying all the common forms of public-private partnership, constituting mainly the build, operate, and transfer, and the BOT annuity models. In BOT, as I need not explain to all of you, the private sector meets the upfront cost, maintains the roads, recovers the cost through tolling during the concession period. There is another provision that we are trying to work into the system with government providing viability gap funding up to 40% of the capital cost. In BOT annuity, the private sector meets the entire upfront cost and expenditure on the maintenance. And here no grant is given, but the recovery is through a predetermined cost indicated by the private sector partner. I'll touch upon a few of the policy initiatives taken by government, which is one is in enabling legislation for private sector agencies to build and maintain roads and recover user charges. And an important step was the setting up of the National Highway Authority of India, or NHAI, I'm sorry, we should have spelt it out in the first place, for development and maintenance of the national highways. Another important step was conferring industry status for road sector investment, which means uh, the usual incentives, and tax holidays, and uh, some concessional loans when they are approached by individual entrepreneurs. <coughs> we have a scheme of provision of capital subsidy, as I was mentioning, the viability gap up to 40% of the project cost. There is a duty-free import of maintenance uh, machinery and equipment and a 100% tax exemption in any consecutive 10 years out of the total 20 years of operation. Government meets all the expenses relating to acquisition of land and other pre-construction activities. This, I may add, is one of the reasons for we have identified for delay, and we are trying to get to work more closely with the state governments for expediting the land acquisition problems. We have a provision for 100% foreign direct investment in the road sector projects, and we are trying to set up ex easier external commercial borrowing norms. Uh, a few words about the investment environment in India. We believe we have stable political institutions, an open society with strong individual and collective rights. We are a mature economy growing currently at around 7 to 8% of the GDP every year. And we have a fairly well-structured institutional framework for entrepreneur-friendly environment. Diversified industrial and manufacturing base, we have an immense capability to absorb technology and supplement it with excellent local options for sourcing inputs. And last, we, and certainly not the least, we have a large pool of trained, skilled personnel. We have a well-defined legal and dispute resolving mechanism in line with UNCITRAL, modern financial systems with sound banking networks, and comprehensive agreements to do avoid double taxation with a number of countries, and I believe U.S. is one. A few words now about the road ahead. We have recently set up, since last year actually, a committee on infrastructure, which is headed by our own Prime Minister, 
with ministers of the key infrastructure sector as members, which is supposed and is attempting policies for creation of world-class infrastructure, delivery mechanisms, and the construction and maintenance. It's also developing structures that facilitate and maximize the role of public-private partnership. It also monitors the progress of key infrastructure projects and, in fact, has weekly meetings devoted to pressing issues in certain infrastructure sectors, including our shipping, transport, civil aviation, and the railways. And it's by 2012, it is, we hope that the investments in highways will attract a total of around $39.2 billion. Emerging opportunities are plenty for investors, contractors, consultants, equipment suppliers, toll operators, intelligent transport system companies, supervision consultants, engineering, production and construction, planning and construction, and civil construction works. For instance, some of the equipment requirement in the short term would be 100 toll plaza systems where we want to introduce software for central toll management with smart card readers, voice communication systems, and e-collection with onboard unit transponders. Advanced traffic managed systems with emergency call boxes, video incident deduction systems, high mast mounted CCTVs, radio communication system, optic fiber communication backbone, automatic traffic counters, and advanced traveler information systems. I'll just have one or two slides on the scenario in road transport in India and a, a section on road safety. The federal government is responsible for policies and legislations for road transport in the country. And policies and legislations are enforced, however, by the state governments. And in some cases, it must be admitted that convergence is proving fairly difficult. Euro 2 emission norms have been adopted throughout our country. Euro 3 norms have been adopted for all the metropolitan cities and many of our major cities. And India is a signatory to the WP29 Convention on Global Technical Regulations aimed at harmonizing our road regulations. Road safety, we, it's no secret that with uh, a billion plus population and a lot of it on the road and in a tearing hurry, with very little lane sense or management, we are not able to enforce it. India has a very high fatality rate on the highways. The federal government has focused on engineering for road safety on national highways and carries out road safety campaigns on the electronic and print media. Assistance is provided for setting up model drivers training schools at key places, and we are hoping to set up one such model school at least in each of the state capitals. And every year, around 100 NGOs all over our country are given grants to carry out road safety campaigns. This has been proving fairly successful with many of our the, the heavy duty truck operators getting good training and it has been paying some dividends. Cranes and ambulances are being provided to states and to NGOs for clearing accident sites and reaching the victims to nearby hospitals. And just recently we have started work on trying to set up an all India network of trauma care centers along our national highways. Finally, I'd like to say we like to believe that India is fast emerging as the destination for investment in infrastructure, especially roads. And the there is an enhanced comfort level through risk mitigation, user-friendly environment, direct capital subsidy, etc., to make investments fairly attractive. For private sector participants, the gains are expected to be multifold as the resilient Indian economy is on an accelerated growth path. And finally, from the, to get a, a fair degree of comfort from the bugbear of government interference, future programs in, road, in the road sector are all to be based 
on private-public partnership with little government control. Thank you. Okay, Mbala, thank you very much. We'll now move, move to Latin America, to Brazil. And uh, I promised Checker I would not say anything about the football, the soccer. I won't say anything about them losing to France or the final four teams not being from Latin America. But other than that, I won't say anything about football. <laughs> but, uh, but please, uh, we welcome you and we look forward to your presentation. <laughs> Hi. It's a pleasure for me to be present in, at in this symposium, invited by the organization. And uh, we prepared this PowerPoint. When we prepared this PowerPoint, we didn't know about the title of the session, Impacts of Road Investments. And, uh, uh, we prepare with the focus of the results of this symposium. The expectation of Brazil, what uh, is important for us and what we expect of the results of this meeting. But even though we can provide you with some information about the road investments in Brazil. Uh, we have a population of 185 million people. You see that the urban population of Brazil reaches 81%. We have 8 million and 500 square kilometers, a GNP now reaching this number that you see. It's a low income. You have a fleet uh, that uh, is around 42 million vehicles. Our industry can produce around 3 million and a half thousand uh, <clears throat> millions uh, vehicles per year and our highway network is one million and seven hundred fifty one thousand kilometers uh, we have one hundred and six thousand kilometers of paved roads Brazil is the fifth largest country in the world, 11th largest economy in the world. And the transportation demand, 25% of service sector workforce and a third of the production sector. I will give some information about the Road Research Institute in Brazil that corresponds to the National Highway Institute in the United States. IPR, which stands for Instituto de Pesquisas Rodoviárias and has its English equivalent as Road Research Institute, is a technical institute concerned with education, standardization, and research for the federal highway sector in Brazil. It operates under the supervision of the, the NIC, it is the National Department for Infrastructure Transportation in Brazil. And for practical purpose, the IPR can be compared with the National Highway Institute of the Federal Highway Administration. The seat of IPR is in the seat of Rio de Janeiro and comprises office, auditorium, laboratories, and a, an experimental track. There is also plenty of green areas around the buildings. The IPR is open to all kinds of interactions. 
The IPR usually, but not only, engages in conventions and agreements with other parts when there is no financial onus on its own side. However, provided that the niche will back it up, the IPR can also function as a funding counterpart in any given project, especially if the other part is from a foreign country or institution. Currently, the main agenda of the IPR revolves around the technical training and deployment of recently admitted personnel, as well as recycling of seniors. The IPR has also a growing interest in new policies, products, and the technologies such as ITS. This is our website. And uh, you can consult and download the entire collection of technical standards, manuals, and the guidelines that are issued by the EPR and that are operative in the highway domain in Brazil and elsewhere. You have here the, the question about uh, the Pan American Institute of Highways that uh, we received some information that uh, they wanted to reconstruct the interaction with Brazil, and we are open to receive the new proposition. We participated here in the United States last October of the Western Hemisphere Program launch, and you produce a formal document that uh, now is going perhaps in the near future to formalized, to be formalized. Uh, we want to say that the IPR uh, responded for the state of art of road engineering. We consider that in terms of uh, specifications, manual, rules, etc., we are up to date. And uh, a symposium like this one is very important for us in order to aprimorate our performance. Now, you, in this part, uh, you can feel what uh, really is important for us to obtain of, of a, a symposium like this one. And uh, you want to see that Brazil is, so to say, a counter of highways, about sixth of freight, and almost 95 of passengers use the highway network. In a certain way, roads have been the two sides of a coin for the development of Brazil. On the one hand, they have permitted the political integration of one of the largest countries in the world and offered a degree of flexibility that the other modes are unable to meet. On the other hand, the cost of building, repairing, and managing the highway network have highly contributed to the so-called Custo Brasil, that is the cost of doing business in Brazil. Counts, much like people, also suffer from inertia and often are attached to their own stereotypes. It's often very difficult to change what has been historically established, even if these patterns hinder a country's development. Mindsets must be changed, and this can only be achieved in gradual steps, maybe over many dec decades ahead of us. Brazil will only become fully aware that it must become a country of all modes in terms of transportation, without relying exclusively on the highway. 
if it is massively exposed to the experience and the reality of different countries. So in the sense that technology, technology transfer must also provide for a simultaneous change of attitudes as to how to face the actual problems. In other words, it's not enough to impart information, to show the tools and the methods of work. It's also essential to provide the cultural substratum for the te technological acquisition and the adjustments to the national temperament and the traditions on the receiving end so that real change can happen. Technological transfer is a two-way lane. The receiving country must work together in the elaboration and adaptation of the material being given and must learn through maturation to become more and more independent from the giving country in terms of maintenance and update of the technology. The giving country, in its turn, must get a feedback from the receiving country so that the shared technology can always get improved. In fact, this feedback and a well-measured market opening should be the preferential forms for emerging countries to pay back for the technology transfer. Technological transfers is as old as the hills. First, primitive man observed animals, and from this observation, he learned basic skills in building, gathering foods, hunting, etc. Later came bartering and then commerce, even wars, abominable as they are, somehow encouraged the interchange of ideas and techniques. Education, of course, is a kind of technological transfer as well, and a very peaceful one for that matter. In our times, technological transfer is often healed by the state and it turns to accredited universities, research institutes, and industries. We cannot forget to mention the internet, which is an almost ideal vehicle for technological transfer, except that it lacks a real practical aspect. The best technological transfer between a developed country and an emerging country might occur in a shared project or research. Both countries work together, putting together the experience and resource of one side and the availability and the need of the other side. At the Road Research Institute in Brazil, we have always been open to technological transfer and we often use our own premise for the development of the national of the organizational projects. Our focus are in the alternative and the road paving and the road construction methods and intelligent transportation system. But uh, these are points that uh, uh, we judge uh, important in this symposium and uh, we expect what we expect of the results of this symposium. Other information, I'm going to pass as quick as possible. Federal Highway Network, total length 93,000 kilometers, of which six, five are paved. It's the main transportation system in the country, carries 96% of the freight and 65 of the passenger in the country. About the railways, not yet fully exploited, total length of 29,000 kilometers, carry 25 of the freight. You see, it's a low number. Are used for passenger transportation only in big cities. About waterways, river transportation has regional importance, basically in Amazon region. Sea transportation uses three main ports, Santos in Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, 
é do Rio Grande do Sul, é da South of Brasil. So, uh, here we have the, some of the problems concerning the highway, poor maintenance, high rate of accidents, deficient infrastructure for the transportation of hazardous products, traffic congestion in big cities, lack of intermodality, the average age of the current vehicle fleet, older than 10 years, theft and assaults, illegal, illegal passenger transportation in big cities. I test technology, we have a great development in Brazil because we have a consistent and a strong program of road concession. We have about more or less 40 enterprises working in road concession. You can, we have more than 20,000 kilometers under concession, consider the federal government and states. This is an examples, example of a road concession connecting Rio de Janeiro in São Paulo. We call Nova Dutra. This is some uh, equipment that we have in, in this road. Excuse, it's uh, Spanish. This is the main building of our Road Research Institute in Rio de Janeiro. This is some information. This is the sequel that you observe in our institute. This is the latest researchers that we have done. We develop uh, coast of road accidents. We finished this research last year. And information on the accidents in Brazil correspond to 1.5% of internal product. It's a high number. We have a, a managing system of a special engineer structure. We have a, about 6,000 bridges and viaducts only the federal network, consider the Amazon region. We have realized for Chile these studies about the properties and the performance of multigrade added to asphalt concrete. We have a contingency plan for accidents connected with the whole transportation of hazardous products. You know, ongoing research, asphalt made with siderurgical waste. We, we want to establish a contact with the Fair, Fairbank Research Center. We want to develop a special uh, equipment to accelerate the, 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 the pavement uh, tests. It's our laboratory says and tests, technical and normative collection. We have a program of standardization. In aspect of our of training in the practically in the last year we reformed about one thousand and five hundred students. Consider the past, we reach around 15,000 students. Interchange with national and foreign organization. We support various sectors of the national department for infrastructure, for transportation. Oncoming programs include the transport of hazardous products. In conclusion, Brazil, a country as big as a continent, still needs investments into its transportation matrix. The focus 
should be on achieving a good and a low cost approach to road maintenance on the prevention of road accidents, on the massive introduction of intelligent transportation systems, and on the improvement of urban passenger intermodal transportation. Brazil has already attained a high degree of technological de development as it, it is shown in its diversified industries and service and in its renewed research centers. But there are serious qualitative differences between the many regions of the country and the, an overall lack of funds. Technology transfer is vital for Brazil as much as user education is, education is, but we too have technologies to impart and we think we can be a leading force among the, the other emerging countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Checker. That was very interesting. All three sessions were very interesting. Uh, we, we have run out of time, unfortunately. The reception is starting on time, and we were kind of squeezed into that. So we maybe have time for a question or two, but uh, I know that uh, Checker and Bala will be here for the duration of the symposium. Tony, will you be here as well for the duration? or? So, uh Tomorrow night. So the speakers will be here for follow up discussions later on, but I guess we'll take one or two questions, please. No. Uh, I think we all recognize we all have great ideas that we could implement. We all have new products. We all have new technologies. We're a little short on money. And I think Mr. Shaker uh, brought up one point that the others haven't mentioned yet incremental change and the difficulty in making change. We recognize what we don't want to talk about. My observation recently by going to my own DOT and trying to get them to think about radical change, big steps forward because of the needs that you have all been bringing up now and in the previous session. In the comments that I got back in thinking about it, it is our government employees in the transportation industry are very overworked. There isn't enough of them. We're seeing a tremendous shortage of them. We're losing people because of retirements. We heard that this right. morning, this, uh, this afternoon. And so I throw it out to you that how can you get change <coughs> when you don't have enough time to accomplish what is necessary in what is on your desk today? And I think if we can address that, then change will come much easier, much faster, and much more willing than what we're facing today. We're at a roadblock as far as I'm concerned because we don't have the willingness at the state and government level to accept change because they are presently overworked. This is our challenge. And we want to discover this as we pass this Our problem is the problem of management. You see, the staff is not enough to do the mission that our department has to manage manage the problems in Brazil. Uh, about 50 to 60 percent of people retired. And uh, we have uh, we have, uh, have solved these problems in the near future. How to do this? We are discussing. theories on how you get change and one school of thought is is have a major issue or problem that causes it. Uh, a guy named Cotter wrote a book on this and it, it's it, take safety for example. I mean I've, ha I've seen some localities where laws have been passed because 10 teenagers were killed. It became such a, an important thing to that community that suddenly laws got changed. Uh, Maryland and Virginia is, is a case in point where that happened two years ago. Both state legislatures took up and passed major new changes. Um, crises in, in floods and earthquakes and God forbid wars can bring about a sudden need for radical different ways of doing things because you're suddenly lost, you've lost the ability with your infrastructure and you've, you've suddenly 
anyway, it's a crisis theory of change. You, you have to create a real momentum to bring it about. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, performance-based management and specs is going to be something that's really going to bring it about in some respects because of declining state forces, local forces, many of whom have left to the, to the consultant world and, and the private sector side. But understanding is going to take different management skills to bring about performance, as Opastar mentioned, describing his three-layer cake so eloquently. I mean, it, it's really bringing about that kind of a change where then you'll see innovations in the way things happen. Uh, I, I don't know. The, and in the U.S., it's, it's problematic because it's going to be state by state where you'll see that radical change taking place potentially. Thank you. Are there any other short questions? Okay, no, I just want to remind you please to fill out the evaluation forms. And while you're doing that, uh, just to summarize, uh, Tony talked to us about Safety Lou. He talked to about us about which programs were seeing increasing and in increased funding, such as innovative financing. He talked about the highway trust funds, short-term challenges. Bala talked about uh, the India infrastructure the road network, his major investment program, uh, NHDP, and talked about the challenges that they face and the importance of their central road fund. He then talked about the uh, policy initiatives that they are undertaking and uh, noted their road safety training. And finally, uh, Checker talked about an overview of Brazil, fifth largest country, described their road institute, and talked very eloquently, I think, about technology transfer and talked about their current and future research projects. Just like to uh, reiterate one more time, the Checker really is the example of the first international technology exchange that we've had as a result of this type of symposium. He is actually in discussions with Turner Fairbank about transferring technology on pavement testing. So I think that's uh, what we are all about, actually making this implementation of these changes. So I'll leave it there. Please feel free to search out the speakers during the reception or later, and we thank you for your participation. The Second International Symposium on Transportation Technology Transfer, St. Pete Beach, Florida, July 30th through August 3rd, 2006. In collaboration with the Local Technical Assistance Program Center, University of Florida, and nine participating national and international transportation organizations, the Federal Highway Administration hosted the second international symposium on transportation technology transfer in St. Pete Beach, Florida, July 30th through August 3rd, 2006. The participating organizations were American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, American Road and Transportation Builders Association, International Road Federation, Local Technical Assistance Program, Tribal Technical Assistance Program, National Construction Career Day Conference, National Local Technical Assistance Program Association, National Transportation Training Directors, Transportation Curriculum Coordinating Council, Transportation Research Board Technology Transfer Committee, Education and Training Committee, and Library and Information Science for Transportation Committee. The symposium objective was to bring together technology transfer officials and managers to share best practices for exchanging transportation technology. The technology of technology transfer. The event included five plenary and over 60 breakout sessions which drew nearly 400 participants from 18 countries. This DVD includes excerpts from the plenary sessions with participation by key United States and international transportation officials. A special guest at the symposium was Ms. Bayan Ismail Dazay Mohammed, Iraq Minister of Construction and Housing, which includes responsibility for the Iraq Highway Program. This DVD will permit you to select a particular session to view. Opening Luncheon Introduction of Congressman James L. Oberstar 
Welcome, transforming the transportation workforce through technology exchange. Impacts of road investments. Partnering for effectiveness. Awards luncheon. Global Road Achievement Awards. Local Technical Assistance Program, Tribal Technical Assistance Program Awards. Special presentation by Iraq Minister of Construction and Housing who has responsibility for the Iraq Highway Program. Workforce Diversity, Challenges and Opportunities. Challenges and Opportunities, Next Steps. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm John McCracken with the Federal Highway Administration. I'll be a moderator this afternoon. I've already failed at my first task of keeping us on time, so uh, we'll do the best we can with what's left of this afternoon's uh, session, this session, that is. But first, I want to, there's been an adjustment in our schedule. We have a privileged speaker this afternoon before we get into our main session. And I want to first introduce Joe Toole, who will take the next step in introducing our honored guest.
Joe Toole, please. Sometimes when you put together a conference like this, you're never sure what's going to happen. And, um, and something very special happened about a week ago when we heard that we were going to have a very special visitor. And after flying halfway around the world to be with us, um, I'm pleased to introduce today that we're, we have with us um, the Minister of Construction and Housing for Iraq, um, Mrs. Bayan Izimael Dizzi. Did I get that? Bayan. And I have to say, I have had the privilege in the last three hours to get to know Bayan, and it's just been an incredible pleasure. Her strength um, stems from years of experience. She is a civil engineer, and she is a very strong advocate of the work that's being done in Iraq. In her responsibility, she has oversight for policy and planning of all aspects of construction and housing in Iraq, including roads and bridges. And you can only imagine what a huge task this must be. She comes to us from being the deputy minister in the Ministry of Housing and Construction in Iraqi Kurdistan, the first woman in that position, the deputy minister of public works in Iraqi Kurdistan, the first woman in that position. And needless to say, she's a tremendous advocate of women in leadership. And I think that she is extremely pleased to see so many of our center directors, university center directors here with us, and also so many women in leadership. So let us please give her a very warm and gracious welcome to the minister. Please join me. سيدات والسادة الحضور الكرام إن من دواعي سروري وافتخاري مشاركتي في حلقتكم الدراسية هذه حول تحويل تقنية النقل والتي يشارك فيها العراق وللمرة الأولى وبداية لا بد لي من تقديم الشكر والتقدير لإدارة الطرق الفدرالية في وزارة النقل الأمريكية مكتب الدراسات الخاصة ورئيسه السيد هنري للمشاركة في أعمال هذه الحلقة الدراسية وأرجو أن يستمر التواصل فيما بيننا في هذا المجال الحيوي والهام نعم. uh, Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and privilege to be attending the second international symposium on transportation technology transfer which Iraq is participating in it for the first time. I would like to thank FHWA and the Office of International Programs directed by Mr. Henry Navarez for giving me this opportunity. إن التطورات الجديدة في قطاع النقل قد ساهمت في ترويج والتشجيع لتطوير نظام الطرق فعال وآمن ومحمي في بلدان كثيرة وهذا الواقع الجديد يتطلب إعداد كادر كفو في مجال النقل لبي طلبات المستقبل في هذا المجال إن إعداد مثل هذا الكادر الكفو يتطلب استكشاف طرق نقل التقنية والتدريب وهذا ما نأمل أن the latest advancement in transportation field has effectively contributed to the development of efficient, safe, and secure transport systems in many countries. We all know that this technological advancement requires that you have a trained staff who is capable of applying these technologies and always ready to learn to meet future transportation requirements. العراق كثيرا من الصعوبات التي عزلت العراق عن العالم طيلة قيود من الزمن وأدت إلى ابتعاده عن مواكبة التطور العلمي والتكنولوجي في مختلف المجالات 
وفي مختلف المجالات ولقد تركت السياسة الخاطئة لنظام الدكتاتوري السابق أثرها على كوادرنا في مختلف الاختصاصات والذين عانوا كثيرا من الانقطاع والحرمان من البرامج التثقيفية ومن الدورات التدريبية ومن التواصل مع ركب العلم والتكنولوجيا السائر بخطة سريعة ومتشة نحو الأمام Iraq suffered tremendously from many difficulties which, is, uh, which isolated it from the international commu community for decades. This isolation caused Iraq to lag behind the world in acquiring new technology in, in the different fields. The inefficient and ineffective policies of the former regime affected our staff abilities to advance. Our staff has suffered a great deal of isolation and was deprived from educational programs and training that utilizes the new technologies. وبعد تحرير العراق بفضل تعاون قوى الديمقراطية والحرية في العالم وعلى رأسها الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية بدأنا مسيرة إعمار العراق رغم الصعوبات الكبرى التي تواجهه البلد وعلى رأسها الإرهاب وكخطوة في هذا الطريق بدأنا بتهيئة المقدمات لافتتاح أول مركز لتحويل تقنية النقل وبدعم مباشر من الإدارة الأمريكية للطرق في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وعبر ممثليها في بغداد وأخص بالذكر منهم دكتور علاء الدين برقاوي المستشار لدى وزارتي After Operation Iraqi Freedom and through the cooperation between the Iraqis and the coalition forces headed by the United States we started our reconstruction process in spite of difficulties that are our country is facing caused by insurgencies. As a first step to our way forward to access technologies and build our staff capacity, we have started the, the preparation to open up a transportation technology transfer center at the ministry with the assistance from our DOT Federal Highway partners and through its representative in Baghdad, and specifically Dr. Aladdin Barkawi, who is our ministry consultant. إن نجاح هذا المركز يعتمد على التواصل الدائم والمستمر بيننا وبينكم وعلى إمكانية فصح المجال أمام ملاكاتنا لتزويد بالخبرة من خلال دراستكم وخبرتكم في هذا المجال والتي نحن بأمس الحاجة إليها وإن أحد أهداف زيارة هذه للولايات المتحدة الأمريكية هي لمعرفة الخطوات اللازمة لكيفية تفعيل هذا المركز في وزارتنا the success of this center depends on our continuous engagement between our two countries, Iraq and the U.S. in this field. One of the main objectives of my visit is to, to the U.S. is to have an open discussion with FHWA's senior leadership focusing on transportation technology transfers issues. I am looking forward to learning more about the necessary requirements to effectively run a T-square center. I hope that my visit will generate the necessary support for this important program. وأخيرا لا يسعني إلا أن أتقدم بالشكر مرة أخرى للهيئة المنظمة لهذه الحلقة راجية لكم الموافقية والنجاح في عملكم. Finally, I would like to thank you all for your kind attention and extend my warmest greetings to the organizers of this symposium and wish them all a great success. Thank you. The Second International Symposium on Transportation Technology Transfer, St. Pete Beach, Florida, July 30th through August 3rd, 2006. In collaboration with the Local Technical Assistance Program Center, University of Florida, and nine participating national and international transportation organizations, the Federal Highway Administration hosted the Second International Symposium on Transportation Technology Transfer in St. Pete Beach, Florida, July 30th through August 3rd, 2006. The participating organizations were American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, American Road and Transportation Builders Association, International Road Federation, Local Technical Assistance Program, Tribal Technical Assistance Program, National Construction Career Day Conference, 
National Local Technical Assistance Program Association, National Transportation Training Directors, Transportation Curriculum Coordinating Council, Transportation Research Board Technology Transfer Committee, Education and Training Committee, and Library and Information Science for Transportation Committee. The symposium objective was to bring together technology transfer officials and managers to share best practices for exchanging transportation technology. The technology of technology transfer. The event included five plenary and over 60 breakout sessions which drew nearly 400 participants from 18 countries. This DVD includes excerpts from the plenary sessions with participation by key United States and international transportation officials. A special guest at the symposium was Ms. Bayan Ismail Dazay Mohammed, Iraq Minister of Construction and Housing, which includes responsibility for the Iraq Highway Program. This DVD will permit you to select a particular session to view. Opening Luncheon Introduction of Congressman James L. Oberstar Welcome, Transforming the Transportation Workforce Through Technology Exchange Impacts of Road Investments Partnering for Effectiveness Awards Luncheon Global Road Achievement Awards Local Technical Assistance Program, Tribal Technical Assistance Program Awards. Special presentation by Iraq Minister of Construction and Housing who has responsibility for the Iraq Highway Program. Workforce Diversity, Challenges and Opportunities. Challenges and Opportunities, Next Steps. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention, I'd like to say welcome, buenos dias, ahoy guasamemasta, ni hao, ahoy, that's Czech if you didn't know. But in many ways, I just wanted to say welcome to all of you to a very special occasion, our second International Transportation Technology Symposium. And this would be nothing without all of you being here. There are over 350 of us here registered as part of this conference. Um, we have 46 international friends with us. And before I say anything else, I'd like to just give them a warm welcome to the United States. Excellent. Uh, representing actually 18 countries. A core of this program also is there are actually eight organizations that are having meetings during this week. Um, the Federal Highway Administration in terms of sponsoring many of these as well and being a partner with them. The National LTAP Association, the International Road Federation, the National Transportation Training Directors, we have four Transportation Research Board TRB committees that are meeting this week. We have the Construction Career Days program. And I've got to tell you, every day I find out there's more and more meetings going on um, around the, the facilities as well with other people hooking up and meeting on different subjects. So I'd like to thank all of these organizations who have been very strong supporters and who have really made this happen. So thank you all. We come together here in a time in which technology is just going through a tremendous explosion. I think everyone here sees it in their own life. Nanotechnology, composite materials, cyber thinking, all of these things that are even new terms in our lexicon. Um, the other day, Where's Lisa Pogue? Lisa Pogue was carrying around her 60 gig um, iPod 
The thing that scares me is I think my brain capacity is about 100 gigs. So we're getting a little too close for comfort there. But she, uh, I think it just shows the amount of information that we have available. But at the same time, transportation is seeing tremendous needs. The global economy, very frankly, is forcing us to look for global solutions. Our challenge and the challenge that all of us come together is how do we make that linkage between those solutions and those problems? How can we bring technologies forward that help our products and services last longer, perform better, and cost less? Well, where does this innovation come from? I'd just like to point out a few. When we look at national research programs, uh, Lori McGinnis had a meeting this morning of the TRB Conduct of Research Program. We have uh, Wes Lum here from Caltrans and the technology that comes from all of the states. The university programs, University of Minnesota, TTI, all of those sources. But I'd also like to highlight how special it is to have our international guest because of the things that we also gain from all of those experience. Kenny, where's Kenny from South Africa? Kenny, every time he comes, he has a new technology and a new idea for me. Uh, Joseph from the Czech Republic, representing the 22 research directors um, in the European nations. Very simply, ideas are everywhere. And our challenge is to connect those ideas with people who need solutions. I think that that's what this symposium is really about and what the impetus for it is. Five years ago, we sponsored the first of these symposiums. If I could ask, how many of you were here five years ago at the first symposium? Good, great. So to all you newcomers, um, this is a fresh experience for you. We've been working on this now for about two years, literally dozens of people working on it. I won't even begin to try to recognize them all, but as you go along this week, just know that they're standing over your shoulder somewhere looking out for your needs. They're a great group, and um, I'll be recognizing them later on in the program. program actually, uh, although this is the official beginning, I'd just like to say that it's already been underway. On Saturday, we had the TRB Committee on Technology Transfer. We had a full house there. We had an excellent meeting. Yesterday, no one knew it was Sunday, and they kept going. We had the TRB Safety Workshop. We had LTAP 101, and the National Transportation Training Directors had their first gathering as well. And today, all morning, we've had meetings as well, the LTAP community getting together, and an international partnering meeting as well. We've got a very rich three days ahead of us, and I can just ask all of you to take advantage of the opportunity you have here. Um, a saying I like is a stranger is simply a friend that you haven't met yet. Please go up, introduce yourself to your new friends. Um, and that means people sometimes working in your own area. Other times it's introducing you to folks that you've never met before. So please make those connections and we very much hope that one of the outputs of this is something that you can all take home with you. And I'd like to reflect that uh, last night when I was speaking with Abu Aziz, um, one of the things he shared with me is if each one of us goes home with one thing that can help our nation, can help our states, then this conference has been a success. So I hope as you go through the week, you keep your eye out for that one thing that you can take home and don't leave home without it. <laughs> Make sure you, you take that back with you. To start off the program, um, something like this takes a tremendous effort and to make a quality transportation program I think it's critical that we have conferences such as this. We're very fortunate today for lunch to have with us a leader who has really championed the quality transportation system that we have in America. And to introduce him is one of our own, Cherie Marty, who is the Associate Director of the Center of Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota. Thank you very much, Cherie. Please come on up.
Thanks, Joe, and welcome everyone. This is really a pleasure for me to be able to have the honors of introducing Congressman Oberstar. And because I'm speaking to a room of transportation professionals, he hardly needs a long introduction. And those of you that know me well know that I can be very brief. <laughs> you know, a little sarcasm there. But I will be a bit brief. Um, Congressman Oberstar was elected in 1974, and he's now serving his 16th term in the 8th District of the House of Representatives for Minnesota. He is senior Democrat with the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. The committee does have jurisdiction over our nation's surface transportation. And from that position, um, Jim really has been a major force in every aspect of transportation legislation for the last 20 years. So just to highlight a couple, he was instrumental in establishing the National Scenic Byways Program in 1991, his, and his support continues very strongly to this day. He was a key architect of the Transportation Equity Act for the 21st century, which of course we all know is the Comprehensive Surface Transportation Act that was passed in 98. He clearly has been a leader in shaping the more recent 2005 Safety Lou legislation. And this group, of course, um, is very interested in safety. So just to mention a couple, um, Congressman Oberstar is a leader in safety. He currently um, has been a champion for Safe Routes to School program, which really serves to improve the health of kids and the community by making walking and bicycling to school safer, easier, and more fun. In fact, I, I was told um, that I believe, Congressman, you have a meeting tomorrow morning, which will be the first national Safe Routes to School state coordinator meeting. So he's continuing his journeys in that. And then I also want to note, about a week ago, um, a number of us in this room, together with Congressman Oberstar, uh, because rural safety is a priority for him, in the safety lieu legislation, there was he has helped to shape a new institute or a new rural center. It's the Center for Excellence in Rural Safety, and that will be housed at the Minnesota University of Minnesota Humphrey Institute. So a number of us were in Duluth just a week ago uh, with Federal Highway, Ashto, and a number of our partners to help shape that rural safety program. And I mention that because I think a number of you would be interested in that, and I know some of our, uh, Yosef with Czech Republic has already talked to me about that, so we'll continue those dialogues. So with that, um, Jim Oberstar, really in closing, is truly a leader who sees the big picture. He's interested in the long term and not just interested in the short term gains, gains of an election term. And we appreciate the fact that he is showing that leadership in maintaining and improving our nation's infrastructure. I do want to say with this group, he clearly, for us at the University of Minnesota, he is champion education, tech tech transfer, and workforce development. So we greatly appreciate that he is here, and it really is my delight and my pleasure to introduce you to Congressman Jim Oberstar. Merci infiniment, chérie. Uh... Je veux tout d'abord souhaiter la bienvenue aux délégués de la France. La France est ici, n'est-ce pas Où est-il Oh, il n'y en a pas oh, Dommage. Je suppose que c'est parce que le Tour de France a été gagné par un Américain. Well, what I said was, uh, I want to wish you a welcome and thank Cherie for that introduction and to wish the a delegate from France, uh, a welcome here, and I didn't see any hand go up. So then I said, well, maybe that's because an American won the tour again. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm an avid cyclist, as you may have gathered. Uh, I, uh, I pedaled 2,700 miles last year. I have to say that that's a fraction of what Lance Armstrong would do in the course of a, of a season. I mean, the, the 2,300 miles of the Tour de France are just 10% of what those cyclists do. They, they pedal 25,000 miles a year. But for 
Well, remember, Congress got a full-time job, a day job and a night job. 2,700 miles isn't bad. And uh, <coughs> I, uh, that, that is, is my salvation. It's my therapy. I get out on a bike and ride off into the, into the uh, north woods of Minnesota or along the north shore of Lake Superior or elsewhere around the country, wherever I travel. One of my uh, uh, I th accomplishments that I feel very proud of was uh, in 1991 uh, opening the Highway Trust Fund to investment in uh, bicycling, uh, converting railroad grade beds to bicycle facilities and building bus bike lanes and urban areas and, and uh, developing uh, bicycle trails. At the first, uh, the Associated Builders and Contractors and the Associated General Contracts didn't think that was such a good idea, diverting highway funds from roadways. But then I pointed out to them that I see their road machinery equipment building the bike trails as well as the roadways. You get the money either way. It doesn't make any difference to you. <laughs> and they caught on. And now Pete Ruane, Pete, raise your hand. Come on, Pete, Pete's my favorite guy in transportation. He was for a $375 billion investment in surface transportation when the White House and the whole rest of the crowd were, oh my God, wringing their hands, we can't spend that much money, and Pete was out there in front. And the only reason we got 286.5 was, frankly, because Pete Ruane led the Associated, uh, the uh, uh, American Road and Transportation uh, Builders Association and led the rest of the business community into supporting it, or, or we'd have been a, another $50 billion lower. Pete, you're a champion for transportation. Thank you. <laughs> well, a few years later, we have 35,000 lane miles of bicycle trails. Uh, we're, uh, uh, the bicycling has gone to a $6 billion a year business, and Americans are getting healthier. You come here from many countries, and I, I, I join uh, Cherie and, uh, and Federal Highway Administration in welcoming all of you to this uh, symposium, and thank you for your participation, and hope that you'll find it to be a useful and beneficial exchange of ideas and, uh, and, of, uh, uh, and, and a two-way street. Share with us your ideas, your uh, concerns, uh, and uh, we can learn uh, from each of you transportation specialists throughout the world. Every year it seems that I have visitors uh, to my office and to my uh, colleague, the chairman of our committee, Don Young, uh, chairman of the Surface Transportation Subcommittee, uh, Mr. Petri of Wisconsin, uh, who come looking to understand how we built the interstate highway system. What is, what is this mechanism that you call the Highway Trust Fund? And uh, just recently, maybe it was three months ago, the Minister of Transportation of France was in. We had a very long discussion. Uh, of course, it was, it was very free-flowing since I, as you could imagine, I speak French rather well. Uh, he said, we, we don't have a trust fund. We have the general revenues, and we have to compete with all other sectors of our society and of our, uh, of, of our national economy. And where do you get these ideas for new initiatives in transportation? And I said, we have the Transportation Research Board. And I explained how the TRB works. State, federal, specialists, the best minds in transportation across the country. We have the National Research Council. We have the uh, National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences. And we harness those ideas. We harness the best minds in America to come up with ideas that can make transportation more effective and, and, uh, uh, and more efficient. And the minister said, we have nothing like that. I sent it back with a bundle of material on, on all of our uh, research initiatives and about the university transportation centers. When, uh, when we initiated that idea in 1991, people said, oh, well, what can academia provide? Well, the uh, fact is that uh, it, it isn't just academia. As uh, Peter Wayne knows, uh, practitioners from the private sector participate in the initiatives of our research university centers. And most of these are, are land-grant 
colleges and universities. Started in, in uh, 1858 for the purpose of diffusing knowledge to the working and agricultural classes of America. That was the Morrill Act. And that is what we continue to do through the university transportation centers 150 years later, is to diffuse knowledge, get the best minds working with the practitioners to, diffuse, to develop new ideas and then diffuse that knowledge. One of the reasons American agriculture is uh, premier in the world, that one farmer today can feed 80 people compared to 40 years ago, one farmer fed 16 people, is the diffusion of knowledge from our university centers through the uh, agricultural outreach program, through our extension program. Farmers sitting in their barn, in their dairy barn in central Minnesota can get the best ideas, the most recent information from their extension service from the University of Minnesota and translate it today into better agricultural practices. That's what we need to do with transportation. That's why we have the, the research funding. We have to find better ways of serving the transportation user and diffuse knowledge, transfer that knowledge as quickly as possible from research centers to the practitioners in the field. And that's what's important about this International Transportation Technology Transfer Symposium. That's, what it's, that, that's why this is so important, to uh, expand the dialogue on technology, the role that it plays in creating a safer, more efficient transportation environment. The traveling public has a need and, and relies upon all of you, all of us transportation professionals, to do the thinking, to create the safer roadway, to create the more efficient movement of goods and people. And why is this important? Well, in 1987, the cost of, uh, of logistics in our society, moving people and goods consumed 17% of our gross domestic product. It was a huge cost, moving people and goods. Waterway, airways, highways, railways. But because of the investments that we've made in the success of transportation bills, of ICE-T and T21 and now the Safety Lou bill, in just 15 years, the cost has gone down from 17% of a GDP to less than 9% of our gross domestic product. In an $11 trillion economy, that's a productivity gain of more than $700 billion a year. It means it's costing us that much less to move people and goods than it would have had we stayed with policies of 15 years ago. Now that is a huge improvement, and that's, that's why you are gathered here to use the, the best ideas to improve our productivity in transportation. We have to do a better job with the infrastructure we already have and with building the next phase of infrastructure. And I think uh, probably the best uh, way to, 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 to capsulize this is to make a comparison with aviation. Aviation is about 11% of our gross domestic product. Last year, a billion people worldwide traveled by air. But of that 1 billion, 750 million people traveled in the US airspace. We account for nearly 70% of all air travel in the world. The, uh, the Southern California Air tra uh, Traffic Control uh, Center, Southern, it's called the High Desert Tracon, handles more aircraft movement than all of Europe combined. 2.4 million aircraft movements a year in the Southern California Terminal Radar Control Facility and 2.3 million aircraft movements in the entire European community. That's how big our, how could we do that without advancing technology to do it? Orville Wright said in the dawn years of aviation, 
I believe the examination and licensing of every pilot should be required. I would insist that proper precautions be taken to ensure the safe condition of airplanes. That was 90 years ago. He saw the need. There, there was a, in the early years of aviation, there was a terrible situation that engines had a bad habit of falling off airplanes in flight. An aircraft could lose a wing in flight. Uh, commercial flyers had one fatality for every 13,000 miles. 1926, one fatality every 13,000 miles. Now the US Airmail Service, which regulated the pilots and regulated safety and established standards for aircraft had one fatality for, for every 453,000 miles. Today it's one in every 100 million miles. That's a huge advance. And how did it happen? Because the Secretary of Commerce in 1925 said, commercial aviation cannot be expected to develop without airways charts, without an aviation weather service, without landing fields, and what, without the ability for night flying services. That Secretary of Commerce who saw and who literally charted the future of aviation was Herbert Hoover, to whom little credit is given for almost anything. But he had a great vision as Secretary of Commerce on what was needed and, and it was Ho Hoover pushing against the entire department, against the entire industry, against the President of the United States who said, we have to do this. And maybe uh, President Harding got the message when he was laying the, uh, uh, cutting the dedication ribbon for the Lincoln Memorial in, uh, in that year. <laughs> and, a, and a general aviation aircraft buzzed the ceremony and drowned out the President's words. Someone said, wait a minute, we, you can't do this. We can't have this. How do you prevent it? We have to develop technology to do this. Today, there are 47,000 pieces of technology in the air traffic control system that make flying safe. Because when you're up there at seven miles in the air, there's no curb to pull over and look under the hood and see what's wrong with the airplane. <laughs> you have to get it right every day, every minute, every time. And that's why we're, we've invested in, in uh, uh, radar screens that can show the altitude of the aircraft, where it started, where it's going, what speed it's at, uh, and, and uh, what weather conditions it's flying in, where the other aircraft are in the same area, and with, uh, with the capacity to show conflict alert that you're getting too close to other aircraft. That there's wake vortex just ahead of you. A wide body aircraft is flown ahead of the 737, you have to avoid that. It's all in the air. It's all on the screen. It's all in the technology. And when the, com when the controller presses a button, that has to respond in less than a fraction of a second because you're moving 10 miles a minute. There's little margin for error. If we can do that in the air, why can't we do it on the ground? Why can't we apply technology to make the difference in safety, in road surface, in efficiency of our systems, in the technology of transportation. That's why we have made the investment in this transportation bill in technology transfer. Two and a half billion dollars for you specialists, professionals, and others like you to think constructively, creatively, and beyond the box about the future. That's a 45% increase in the investment in technology in this bill. It's a 45% increase overall in the $286 billion transportation bill. 286.5, Pete, to be exact. And 
we do have a need to, uh, to think uh, about the future of transportation because uh, unlike the Aviation Trust Fund, which is pegged to the value of your airline ticket, funding for the surface transportation is a flat fee. It's, a, it's the only thing we have that's a flat tax in America. Everybody's equal. So it's begged to consumption. It's begged to use. It's pegged to, to the uh, use of the roadway. And that number is, has been static or has fallen off or has been eroded by the uh, uh, erosion of the value of the construction dollar, which has gone down 47% in the last 15 years compared to only 27% decline in the consumer price index for other sectors. So we have to recapture the value of the construction dollar in order to make the Highway Trust Fund whole and, if, and, and uh, responsive to the needs and the growing needs of the, of the country. I know it's a little diversion from technology, but you have to understand where this money is coming from. And in the transportation bill, we created a commission to, uh, to report on uh, pavement condition, bridge conditions, congestion, uh, need for, uh, need for uh, expanding capacity, and for financing the future of the system. Now, this National Transportation Policy and Revenue Study Commission is, has just been launched. I talked at their uh, formative session, and I said, start with the Highway Trust Fund. It's the most effective social mechanism we've created in America. It includes an anti-deficiency provision that prevents the Highway Trust Fund from running a deficit. It never has, it never will. But just the reverse has happened. The surplus is built up in the Highway Trust Fund over many years have made deficits look smaller, even though the dollars haven't been used for anything else, but it makes deficits look smaller. So the more the presidents from Lyndon Johnson all the way through to Clinton uh, uh, could, could hold money back in the trust fund and make their budget deficit look that much smaller. Well, we fixed that in 1998. We put firewalls around the Highway Trust Fund, said you cannot spend this, you cannot hold the money back, it must go directly out into uh, building of our transportation capacity. And that is working. But what is not working uh, effectively is um, a mechanism, or what is missing, is a mechanism to keep pace with inflation in our society and the erosion of the construction dollar. That's why we need uh, a, a consumer price index uh, or indexing of the Highway Trust Fund to assure that the revenues will grow as the usage grows. We have 212 million vehicles on the roadways in America. That's 60% of all the cars and half of all the trucks in the entire world on our roadways. We need to make sure that they, that, that they can move freely so that we can continue to enjoy productivity gains in our society. So you can enjoy a better quality of life. So you're spending more time with your family and less time on the roadway. That's why we have to make these adjustments to, to have the investments. And in this 50th year anniversary of the interstate highway system, uh, that
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Meet the Nation. <laughs> kind of has that look to it, doesn't it? Um, this is a great opportunity we have. One of the things that we really wanted to, to build on at the beginning of the conference was to really look at the foundation of technology transfer and those things that are really the driving forces behind it. The folks we have up here for our panel today are definitely the driving forces behind transportation today. And joining them shortly will be uh, Congressman Overstar coming back again to uh, be a member of this panel. But let me begin by introducing our other panelist here. Um, it's always nice when you get to introduce your boss. You all know that feeling. It's just, uh, I just realized um, I'm out of uniform here without the blue shirt, but we can all, we'll make it through that. Um, Rick Kapka is no stranger to the T-squared community here. I know that he has spoken at the LTAP conference for a number of years. Um, Denny Judicki and I have met regularly with Rick, kept him up to date on the things that are going on um, in the 